Okay, I'm just going to I'm going to make four points. Um, I'm oh, going to get this just right. Um, the Gender and Development Network um, is 70 organisations and individuals in the UK all working on gender and development issues. Um, and we've been particularly looking at the post-2015 framework because, um, as Lakshmi said, we think it's probably going to be the key way in which we can influence the debates both around um, donor governments and recipient governments and the way that they're going to shape their policies. So it's not that we think this is going to change the world, we don't think this is where the revolution is going to start, but we do think that this is a really crucial way in which to raise some important issues. Um, and that's why I'm so pleased that today's discussion is around social norms. You're always supposed to say that when you're on a panel, that you think that the, the topic's really good, but I really do think this topic's really good, because I think when we look back at what is the missing issue of the MDGs, quite often people say it was violence against women. I think when we look back at what was the missing issue of the post-2015 framework, I think we may say it's social norms. Um, and I think we need to be flagging up now that social norms really is the way, by addressing social norms, that's how we can really start making sure that no one is left behind. Because one of the faults of the MDGs was that they tackled the easy half. Um, if you're going to tackle the <coughs> difficult half, you have to start addressing social norms. You can make the legal changes, you can ch make changes in social services, but if you don't tackle social norms, you're not going to reach the hardest to get, most intangible problems. Because social norms provide the veneer of legitimacy around gender equality. And if we don't, if we don't address those, we're not going to get to that true, um, true ge gender justice. I think my, that, that's my first point. My second point is that I think we have to be very aware about the backlash that may be coming. Because within discussions around post-2015, most people now know that they need to mention the word gender. Um, what, most people, what most governments have not yet done is made the actual commitments around gender. And I think we need to be ready for the backlash. And I think on social norms, the backlash may be twofold. The first is around culture, as Grace mentioned that this social norms are thought to be cultural and therefore untouchable. Mm. Now we know, particularly when you come to looking at gender, about the universality of the issues that we face on gender. We also know that we've got CEDAW, which is an international agreement which most governments have signed, which cover most of the areas that we need to address. Mm. So we need to debunk this myth that gender gender inequality is somehow cultu culturally specific and therefore untouchable. The second um, backlash that I think we may face is around fe feasibility. Um, all the issues that we know around how difficult it is to measure social norms. Caroline can give you quotes for uh, databases on almost everything to do with social norms. It's quite impressive. <laughs> there, there, is increase there are increasingly um, data collection around social norms that can be used. That's the first point. But I think the second and more important around feasibility is that there is an inverse relationship between how socially important an issue is and how much data is collected around it. Data collection is a political issue. Um, and we need to argue that the post-2015 framework should be based around what is politically necessary and the data collection should follow, not the other way around. That was my second point. My third point is which social norms? Um, because my plea here is that in addition to talking about the social norms around violence, the social norms around education, the social norms around early forced marriage, I think the Cinderella of gender issues is unpaid care and household roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think if we don't start talking now about the social norms around unpaid care and household responsibility, it's going to be the post-2015 framework conversation that we actually start addressing that. We need to start talking about unpaid care now. And I thought a, a lot of the quotes that, that Grace used actually referred back to household responsibility. And I, I thought it was, when you, when you actually get back to the quotes of what people are doing, when the people are talking about their own lives, mm -hmm. it, quite often it comes back to unpaid care. Um, so my, uh, my fourth point, my final, final set of points, how? How do we do this within the post-2015 framework? I think one of the things that we can do is that there's always a kind of preamble around a framework such as this. Now, those preambles quite often get lost because they're not specific goals and targets, but they're still important. And in that, I think that we need to start the discussion 
around the role that social norms play actually in organising society. Because the MDGs tended to see women and girls as a group that needed help. Whereas I think we need to start explaining that gender norms, gender relations, are a way in which society is organised. And that perhaps, possibly, we could get into the, the preamble of the framework. Mm. I think in that preamble, we also, coming back to Grace's point, need to start gently challenging the untouchability of culture um, and the universality of, of, of gender roles. Both Tanya and actually both mentioned the importance of a gender goal. The Gender and Development Network has become slightly obsessed about the importance of a standalone gender goal, so I'm not <coughs> even going to mention any more because they've both done it, but it's crucial. But also what's crucial is the targets underneath that. And I think we should be calling for a target under the gender goal which explicitly addresses unequal social norms. Um, <coughs> rather, than, rather than them just being a way of measuring other things, let's actually have that as a target. But perhaps even more important than that, and again, like you touched on this, is the indicators. That one of the things that, that Grace's presentation showed was that if you get the wrong indicators for measuring whether or not you've achieved gender equality, yeah. it may appear to be that you have <coughs> achieved equality, for example, in, edu in education, but if you don't have the right indicators, you won't actually know whether that equality has been achieved. Mm -hmm. So far, there aren't really indicators around social norms, but they're possible, and we ought to be making sure that when we're measuring a particular target, we're using indicators. So, for example, with maternal mortality, Maternal mortality was, was a really important target to have in the MDGs, but on the whole, the, the indicators that we used was around birth attendance. Yeah. Really important, but all those other things that affect maternal mortality were, weren't um, highlighted because they weren't indicators. So what indicators we use is key with social norms. Um, and then um, finally, mm. the, the development of data collection. And I th that there's been talk of a data revolution within the post-2015 framework. This is the time to start getting data collect collected on social norms. This, I think this is the time when we can incentivise that data collection by having indicators on social norms. So I think if, if we could do anything in the post-2015 framework on social norms, I think that's the most likely thing to do. That's fantastic. Caroline. Okay, well, uh, Jessica very artfully said, why don't you go last and sum up? Um, <laughs> so, um, and I would be in danger of repeating um, much of, of what other people have said, so I will just try and touch on a few things to, um, to reflect on, on what we've been talking about from the very sort of contextual level of working with individual girls in Uganda through to this global policy um, uh, around the MDGs, which... Um, very, very different dimensions of the same problem. Um, so, th so the four points I'd, I'd want to make are really, um, we have actually been working on culture and development for many years. Um, uh, we use different terms to talk about culture, but we, we must never forget how entrenched patriarchy is, how sensitive it is um, in any context, internationally um, or nationally, um, it's still a taboo issue um, in many countries, but it does change, and there are ways in which we all work that illustrate how change does happen. But as uh, Jessica said, there's always a backlash, and we, um, there's always, always a backlash. Mm. When an issue around gender starts to gain prominence, there will be a backlash, and, and we need to just be aware of that and just work through it. Um, the second area is, is really then can the development community and how does it address these complicated issues. Um, I certainly have many times w walked into uh, donor agencies um, in developing countries or into uh, ministries where people just say, oh, we don't work on adolescent girls. And I'll be talking to a donor that funds programs on education and health, but they don't think about adolescent girls in the whole and what they need. Um, and so the way in which we think about uh, addressing social norms and addressing adolescence in particular in relation to what we're talking about today, um, we have to present that well to um, both within the development community and also to the, the, the governments that we're working with. Um, as Jessica mentioned, I have been working on how we, how we collect data and think about social norms and a lot of uh, the gender indices actually look very much at outcomes. Um, and I've been working more recently with the SIGI index, which actually looks at norms, and it's a very 
ambitious and complicated index. And it was set up by economists, which I thought was, um, was really interesting that they had recognized the importance of social norms. Um, and it is an index <coughs> which tries to track change, um, do have a look at it. They have country profiles. It's, it's not uncomplicated, of course. It's very controversial. But it is trying to put up front and, and high in the uh, as a sort of policy agenda and international community um, social norm issues and to measure change in social norms. It's run by the OECD DAC, and this year they're going to be developing um, the same index in developed countries in the OECD, which is a great leap forward for them. They've been trying to do it for some time and meeting resistance within the OECD. So they will have as much of the same index looking at developed and developing countries to make it a truly global index. Um, another area I just wanted to mention was, was about poverty and social norms, because in our field work we have found this a very complex area. If you address poverty, will social norms change? And, of, and what we are finding is, of course, there is some change related to addressing poverty, but there is a lot of change that doesn't happen that one might expect to happen by addressing poverty. And if you think about poverty programming and focusing on poverty, and we spent many years talking about multidimensional poverty um, and how we might uh, have poverty programs that are fully integrated, these don't address the needs of adolescent girls. Many of them, for example, don't address violence, so they wouldn't think of necessarily addressing violence. Um, so, although we have a good start with multidimensional poverty programming, we actually need to think in a different way about addressing um, uh, social norms. And finally, on the MDGs, I think uh, Jessica said everything that there was to be said about thinking about the MDGs and, and uh, gender issues. Um, but uh, I suppose the three areas that I would, would highlight are, yes, we need a gender goal, um, we need that political will to be generated at a national level, and we need the self-reflection <laughs> to be generated at a national level. In terms of what we're discussing about in t within that goal and in relation to gender, social norms are embedded in everything that is in that we might discuss in terms of the issues or the indicators. And it's pulling out the social norm which will actually make the change, because those are the fundamental uh, uh, drivers of um, discriminatory um, issues. And then finally, data. If we don't have any information about it, we can't measure it, we can't think about it, we can't talk about it. When you bring up data, especially as a researcher, there's sort of sighs around the road, you know, researchers want to collect data. But if we don't know anything about it, how can we talk about it? And there is a real lack of evidence um, and around adolescence in particular. Research has been lamentably poor looking in terms of looking at adolescents and adolescent girls. And um, it's an area that we really do need to focus on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to now move into straight into questions. Um, and we've got, um, I think, questions from outside the room as well as in the room. Um, I'd like when I come to you to, to ask that you state who you are and your organisational affiliation. And we'll take them in batches of three. Um, so um, please keep your question really short and tight so we've got more time for, for discussion. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to then turn to the panel and invite you to pick up the questions that you think are most relevant um, for you to, to answer. 